The ISF is one of the biggest street lifting organizations in the world on par with Final Rep, having established national branches in 18 different countries. It is perhaps one of the oldest existing street lifting organizations in the world, giving rise to competitive street lifting first in Russia. Thus, the original intent of this organization was to be the leaders of the world, establishing how the growth of street lifting would be conducted. But over the past few years, this didn't happen. The reputation of the organization was falling apart, and one of the biggest reasons was because of their rule book. From not being able to use an open thumb positioning for pull-ups to only locking the chin fully past the bar, the ISF rulebook was years behind other organization rulebooks, and it was one of the main key factors that kept elite athletes in other countries besides Russia away from their competitions. But recently, the rulebook has changed. After a long delay in a new version of the rulebook, it has finally been released. A lot of new changes have been implemented, and today, I wanted to review the notable rule changes and non-changes and what this means for the future of the ISF. Starting with the most major rule change, the removal of the locked chin. ISF is notoriously famous for this specific chin rule in which the chin had to be above and completely over the bar. This led to a lot of athletes reducing the amount of weight that they could otherwise pull with more standard chin rules by at least 5 kilos. But now ISF has reduced the horizontal closing distance by allowing the chin to pass over the closest edge of the bar. And the more interesting detail within this rule is the regulation of the jaw. The jaw bone now has to be above the horizontal plane of the bar, which will prevent athletes from looking up in order to quote gooseneck. So already ISF is establishing itself as an organization that doesn't tolerate the use of any type of neck movement, just a purely straight chin. They even include one particular reason for a no rep, which is quote, to take the correct position of the body at the upper point by the power of the jaw and not the arms. So essentially, you cannot even do a neck curl in order to secure the rep, which is something that we often see among guys that train locked pulls and chins. This is really interesting, and I definitely want to see how this particular rule is enforced in competition. Of course, I don't agree with it, not because it's not practiced in other organizations, but because it still favors chinners massively more so than pullers. Any type of chin rules where the horizontal chin clearance has to be accomplished with a neutral neck position will always favor chinners purely because it's just so much easier to close the chin on a supinated grip from a biomechanics standpoint. On top of this, the ISF still treats the pull up and chin up as the same exercise even in the classic version, therefore the issue gets more pronounced and there really is no point in my opinion at least to be competing in any ISF competition under this rule set using pronated grip unless you're extremely gifted in that extra range of motion. One of the other major rule changes related to the pull up is the option of using the open thumb positioning. This is one of the biggest changes for the pull up because the ISF is also notoriously famous for its thumb rules. Before this rule change you were only allowed to have a closed thumb positioning because whoever wrote the rule book wanted this particular rule to be applied to both pull-ups and dips, which doesn't make sense since the influence of the thumb is different in both exercises. So I'm really glad to see a sensible change with this particular detail, and I think it will definitely attract a lot more athletes, especially those that find that they can generate more power with an open thumb positioning. Another interesting rule change that occurred is within the dips. The following reason for a no rep was added to the list of reasons for dips, and this one reads, quote, a body tilt in which the shoulders go down faster than the pelvis, unquote. This is very interesting because to me, it seems as if this restriction fundamentally changes the entire dip form so that there's less of an uneven distribution of the recruitment between the chest and triceps. I think you can still have equal recruitment between the chest and triceps as long as you're 
upper arm is not disproportionately longer than it needs to be. But for guys who have the proper leverages, this is very favorable for them since the speed of their shoulders and pelvis are already pretty even to begin with. So in reality, it just further increases their chances of placing podium. For long-armed individuals, in order to keep the speed of your shoulders the same as the pelvis, you cannot lean forward as much, which means that you're going to get a lot more hip depth. And because of this, you have to rely more on dipping upright, which is honestly the worst rule change in this version. And I'm very surprised that they added this especially considering the shoulder injury risks that weighted dips are famous for. Now the next major rule change is probably the biggest, which is the addition of the all four format. Unsurprisingly, the ISF decides to call this format the quote weighted calisthenics format, but regardless, I'm still happy to see the all four format in the rulebook now, and I think this is a huge plus for the ISF. I guess they saw how successful Final Rep Worlds was and wanted to establish their own type of all four world championships, which if they do, they're going to be competing against Final Rep. And I hope that they can actually execute it this time. But realistically, I hope now with this new format that we get to see more Eastern Europeans competing in all four. And I know there are plenty of powerlifters and street lifters on that side of the world who have insane strength already and can easily make the transition to all four training without any issues. The ISF rules for the muscle up and squat seem to be sensible enough and in fact the description of the squat rules is an exact replica of the IPF squat rules which is a good thing. The muscle up rules are also pretty decent although it doesn't include whether or not a lifter can pause momentarily after completing the transition phase and right before the dip phase. But I guess the absence of this nuance indicates that it is allowed. The next major rule change is the addition of the muscle up to the multi-lift format. And this is really interesting because this has only ever been tried once before back in Ukraine where they had the street workout and street lifting championships. The weights that they used to perform the muscle ups was 20 kilos. But in the ISF rule book, although they list the muscle up as a multi-lift movement, they don't list the associated weights that go with the exercise unless I'm missing something. But I still think regardless, it's an interesting idea to try out and I never shoot down any potentially good ideas. But I am skeptical of how it would work if the entire multi-lift format consisted of the muscle-up, pull-up, and then dip, as I could see potential issues from that particular format, especially with that specific exercise order. Now I want to talk about one last rulebook detail, and that is the dip depth. The ISF is still notoriously famous for its very short range of motion dip, which only requires that the humerus bone meets the 90 the green mark. This has still not been changed and I've argued before with them that the reason this should be changed is mainly because of the subjective judging that this particular depth invites. From a judging perspective, it's actually more difficult to judge the depth of a bone that you cannot see rather than a visible outline of the arm, which would be the rear delts at or below the elbows. But hey, what do I know? They have over 100 certified referees. All I can say is it will be very interesting to see if the ISF can attract more participants into their competition due to the other rule changes and to see what kind of dip numbers these athletes could dip with that kind of depth. The additional poundage that you could dip with this shorter range of motion is probably an additional 10 kilos, maybe 15 if I'm being optimistic, but it's definitely nothing insignificant. Anyway, y'all, those are my honest thoughts and review of the latest version of the ISF rulebook. Obviously, it's going to impact a lot of athletes and the way they train for this event, especially in countries where ISF has established national branches. So it'll be interesting to see how guys from Kazakhstan, Russia, and Serbia, which in my opinion are the three countries that have the largest ISF influence, train for their competitions. I think overall the ISF definitely brought my hopes back up at least somewhat, and they have taken a step in the right direction. However, I still see a lot of imperfections within their rulebook, which hopefully by the next version 
which will be in many years from now, will get addressed. I still think the rules that are put forth by the French Germans and my own organization are the best because they are the most sensible, fair, and supportive of the athlete to express his full potential. Anyway guys, let me know in the comment section what you think about the newest version of the ISF rulebook. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks for watching.